have previously told you we may be interrupted with a vote, so Mr. Courtney and I both have agreed that we're just going to put our opening statements in for the record so that we can go ahead and begin and try to get um, all the testimony in and then hopefully uh, get to our questions and answers. Today, uh, joining us are two thought leaders in the area of surface warfare, Mr. Brian McGrath, the managing director of the Ferry Bridge Group, and Mr. Jonathan Solomon, Senior Analyst, Systems Planning and Analysis Incorporated. And gentlemen, both of you, uh, we appreciate you being here today. And Brian, it's my understanding you're going to start us off. So with that, we uh, yield the floor to you. Uh, first of all, Joe, did you have anything you wanted to add? Okay. Great. Chairman Forbes, thank you. Ranking Member Courtney, members of the subcommittee, thanks again for the opportunity to testify with you on a, a matter of importance to our Navy and to the nation. The discussion today revolves around uh, game changers and innovations in the future of surface warfare. And I have um, a few of those in my written um, statement that I submitted. Love to answer some questions about them if you have them later. Some of those game changers include, they, they flow almost all from the concept of distributed lethality, which is something I know you've heard a lot about lady, lately, uh, including long range surface to surface missile improvements, multi source maritime targeting and tracking, real-time ISR vulnerability assessment, electromagnetic spectrum warfare, and medium altitude long endurance UAVs. But um, I think before we jump into the sort of tactical and operational stuff, I, I'd like to elevate it back to some first things. Uh, I realize no one was being glib when the title of this hearing was chosen but I think it's important that we think about exactly what, it, what game it is that we are seeking to change. Um, and as we watch China reprise its ancient role of dominance in the East, and we watch Russia exhibit its modern version of a, its historic geographic paranoia, we're confronted with the obvious reality of multipolar great power competition. This reality leads me to conclude that the game, for want of a better term, is conventional deterrence. And this is a game for which I think the United States Navy is somewhat less prepared than I would like. There are many reasons for this, and, I, and we can discuss them as you desire. Among them, however, is the accreted effects of decades without a competitor, and the Navy's slow realization that this is no longer the case. That this realization has occurred late is bad enough, but, but it is compounded by the impact of ruinous um, resource uh, constraints. The second issue, uh, and I'd like what I'd like to close on on this statement is, um, I think we have a little bit of a collective fascination with technology. Um, senior officials in the Defense Department will tell you with a straight face that the third offset strategy is not all about technology, and then commence a 40-minute discussion about the third offset strategy that is all technology. Um, Offset strategies one and two occurred when the United States dominated the technology uh, world worldwide. And even within the United States, technology was dominated by the government and by the military. Neither of those conditions uh, applies today. Um, technology has been commercialized and globalized, and trying to pull a rabbit out of the technology hat again is going to prove much more difficult this time. There is no substitute for the nation spending what is required in order to see to its security and prosperity. There is no substitute for the time-honored contributions of stockpiled weapons, powerful forward-deployed surface ships, combat-ready surge forces, and a robust industrial base. There's no, such, no substitute for the psychology of conventional deterrence which suggests to potential aggressors that not only is your aggression going to be punished, but it's likely to be unsuccessful. I counsel against ignoring these simpler notions while we search for technological silver bullets. World leadership cannot be had on the cheap, and we must decide whether we continue to value our position and role in the world, and then resource it accordingly. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Mr. Solomon. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Forbes, Mr. Courtney, and Mr. Mr. Solomon, can you... Pull that a little bit closer and make sure it's turned on. So, yeah. Great. First, I'm apologize. Okay, uh, thank you, Chairman Forbes and Ranking Member Courtney and all members of the Sea Power and Power Projection uh, Force Subcommittee for granting me the honor of testifying today. I'm going to keep my remarks uh, about three and a half minutes because I'm very excited to get forward into the open uh, question and answer. 
So a bit of background, I'm a former U.S. Navy Service Warfare Officer, and I served as anti-submarine warfare officer and Aegis Fire Control Officer and destroyers during my two-division officer tour before leaving active duty. My civilian job of the past eight, 11 years at Systems Plan Analysis Incorporated has been to provide programmatic and systems engineering support to various surface combat systems acquisition programs within the portfolio of the Navy's Program Executive Officer for Integrated Warfare Systems. This work has provided me an opportunity to participate, however peripherally, in the development of the, some of the surface Navy's future combat systems technologies. It has also enriched my understanding of the technical principles and considerations that affect combat systems performance. This is no small thing, considering that I am not an engineer by education. Before I continue, I want to make clear that the views I expressed today are presented solely in my personal capacity. They do not reflect the official positions of Systems Planning Analysis Incorporated, and to my knowledge, do not reflect the positions or, po uh, or policies of the U.S. Department of Defense, any U.S. Armed Service, or any other U.S. government agency. In recent years, and with the generous support and encouragement of Mr. Brian McGrath, I've taken up a hobby of writing articles that connect my academic background in maritime strategy, naval history, and naval technology and deterrence theory with my professional experiences. One of my favorite topics concerns the challenges and opportunities surrounding the potential use of electronic warfare in modern maritime operations. The subject that I first encountered while on active duty and later explored in great detail during my master's thesis investigation how advanced wide area oceanic surveillance reconnaissance targeting systems of systems were encountered during the Cold War and might be countered again in the future. Electronic warfare receives remarkably little attention in the ongoing debates over future operating concepts and the like. Granted, classification serves as a barrier with respect to specific capabilities and systems. But electronic warfare's basic technical principles and effects are and have always been unclassified. I believe that much of the present unfamiliarity concerning electronic warfare stems from the fact that it's been almost a quarter century since U.S. naval forces last had to be prepared to operate under conditions in which victory, not to mention survival, in battle hinge upon achieving temporary localized mastery of the electromagnetic spectrum of the adversary. America's chief strategic competitors intimately understand the importance of electronic warfare to fighting at sea. Soviet Cold War era tactics for anti-ship attacks heavily leveraged what they termed radio electronic combat. And there's plenty of open source evidence available to suggest this remains true in today's Russian military as well. The Chinese are no different with respect to how they conceive of fighting under informatized conditions. In a conflict against either of these two great powers, the US maritime forces sensors and communications pathways would assuredly be subjected to intense disruption, denial, and deception via jamming or other related tactics. Likewise, ill-disciplined electromagnetic transmissions by U.S. maritime forces in the combat zone might very well prove suicidal in that they could provide an adversary a bullseye for aiming as long-range weapons. To their credit, the Navy's senior-most leadership have gone to great lengths to stress the importance of electronic warfare in recent years, most notably in the new maritime strategy. They even launched a new con concept they call electromagnetic maneuver warfare, which appears geared towards exactly the types of capabilities I outlined in my prepared statement. It's therefore quite likely that major elements of the U.S. Navy's future war surface warfare vision, distributed lethality, will take electronic warfare considerations into account. I would suggest that distributed lethality's developers do so in three areas in particular, command and control doctrine, force-wide communications methods, and over-the-horizon targeting and counter-targeting measures. I want to be clear that the tools and tactics I advocate for in my prepared statement will not serve as silver bullets that shield our forces from painful losses, and there will always be some degree of risk and uncertainty involved in the use of these measures. It'll be up to our force commanders to decide when conditions seem right for their use in support of particular thrusts. Such measures should be viewed as force multipliers that grant us much better odds of per perforating an adversary's oceanic surveillance reconnaissance systems of systems temporarily and locally if used smartly, and thus better odds of operational and strategic successes. And with that, I look forward to your question and discussion. I'll follow. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McGrath, when you've talked a lot about distributed lethality as kind of a game changer for surface fleet operations, especially with our carrier groups. Um, there is a huge risk to that, however, though, as we begin to for distributed lethality to work, we're going to have to um, distribute um, our force away from the carrier <coughs> where we have normally used it for protection. Um, two questions I have for you. Um, Describe that risk. How do we know that that risk is worth taking? Because uh, do we not increase the vulnerability that we would have for our carrier in that particular situation? And the second thing is we don't get to tell the Navy how to fight. We simply help provide them resources for them to utilize when they've made those decisions. What shifts would we have to make in our resourcing if we were to move to a distrib distributed lethality concept or operation of fighting? The risks, uh, your first question, uh, Chairman Forbes, the, the 
The surface leadership has been very clear from the beginning that job one remains high value unit protection. That um, the anti-surface, anti-submarine, and an integrated air and missile defense capabilities that they provide to the strike group through the uh, ships of the surface force cannot and will not um, be diminished. But there are other surface ships in the war plans that are not necessarily allocated just to supporting high value units. It is with these ships, and hopefully in a future where we build more ships, uh, that distributed lethality will have its greatest impact. The second question with respect to uh, where you might shift your resources, uh, um, long range surface to surface missiles, um, job one, the quicker the better. Um, more pressure on the Navy rather than less. You don't get to tell them how to fight, but you can ask really hard questions and make them uh, give really hard answers. Why would we not uh, harvest low-hanging fruit in order to take our, our longest-range surface-to-surface weapon from approximately 70 miles to 1,000 miles in five or six years? That seems to me like it's worth, worth considering. It's the turning the the Tomahawk land attack missile into a hybrid uh, surface and land attack missile. Um, so I would, I would uh, urge you to uh, push hard on surface to surface missiles and I would urge you to push hard on closing the, the grand fire control loop. We have national technical means, we have um, UAVs, we have battle group assets, theater assets, fleet assets, all of these assets are creating data, taking measurements, information. We need to make sure that that data is fused and that uh, fire control quality tracks are sent back out to the ships in a way that can be tactically useful and relevant. We have all the pieces, they're just not very well con connected yet. And you should make the Navy tell you how they're gonna do that. So let me just make one clarifying, or I add one clarifying question. As I hear you, you're suggesting that we're not taking away any of our defensive capabilities. We're simply adding a supplement to that, which would have offensive capabilities, because it was my understanding from most of the briefings that I've gotten from the Navy on distributed lethality that they were uh, talking about something a little different, where they were trading off current offensive capabilities. I'm sorry, defensive capabilities for more offensive capabilities. But that's not the way you see distributed lethality. Not at all. Okay, good. Okay, Mr. Courtney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses. Um, uh, the title of the hearing is about game-changing um, innovations, and, uh, and I think, again, we've heard a good um, discussion about offensive sort of um, game-changing uh, innovations. Um, in terms of you know electric electronic warfare, um, in terms of hardening, I think that was the term that Mr. McGrath used in his testimony, um, our fleet. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that sort of piece of game-changing. So I think it's twofold. It's both technological and psychological. Uh, from a technological standpoint, um, and this is my personal opinion again, uh, the Navy has not invested in electronic warfare to the extent that it did during the Cold War you know, over the last uh, 30 years or so. Um, there's certainly fantastic capabilities out there and certainly new fantastic capabilities in the development path, but you get the sense that the Navy is a little bit behind in terms of uh, pacing the types of threats that we're seeing right now from other great powers. Um, so there's certainly a technological aspect to it in procur procuring new systems that give us the new capabilities, but I, I personally see that the psychological is actually perhaps the more disconcerting one. And that's, again, in 30 years, we haven't conditioned our forces for operations under opposed electromagnetic conditions. You know, back in the Cold War, we routinely operated our carrier battle groups at emissions control conditions, MCON. Um, they'd be dark for days on end, driving around the Atlantic, driving the Soviets nuts in terms of trying to find them. Uh, during my research, I found that in 1981, and this is, again, not been confirmed by the Navy, but it's enough anecdotal evidence to show that something like this probably happened. We drove a combined U.S. NATO battle force up into the Norwegian Sea, right out of Norfolk, and the Soviets didn't find it until we started running offensive drills right off of the Northern Cape. And I, the amount of discipline required to do that is just kind of staggering. It's disciplining when we talk on the radio, when we radiate, 
who radiates, um, flying an E2 off the carrier using an emissions control profile so it gets outbound, pops up to make it difficult for the, uh, uh, the opponent to figure out where it's actually flying from. And these are, these are all tactics that you don't get to you know, proficient in overnight. It takes a long time. And on the other side of the coin, it takes a long time to build up the psychological hardening for when the adversary starts jamming your communications, jamming your radars. And you know, we used to have uh, drills where we would jam ourselves harder than you know, the Russians might have, you know, so I've been told. Um, and certainly they use various tricks when they came out to visit us back in those days, I've been told as well. And I'm not sure we've done that type of training in the last couple decades. Certainly when I was on active duty, we didn't do that. So if you look at what we'd have to be able to do, both in terms of hardening ourselves against the adversary's electronic warfare and being able to do the kinds of things we did the Soviets to great powers today, I'm not sure we're there. I think it requires a great deal of training, a great deal of experimentation, um, and a great deal of just basic conditioning from the highest levels of the Navy on down, where we let captains and um, deck plate uh, sailors and officers know that it's okay to take some risk. It's okay to take the tactical initiative. You're not gonna have some senior officer back on the carrier even further away micromanaging your decisions over, over a comms net because we know that net wouldn't be survivable if uh, in, in the event of war. And so we're willing to take some of those tactical risks to, uh, to do that. And I think that that's a big missing piece of that. And Mr. McGrath, I mean, you were sort of alluding to the same sort of um uh, innovation is, it's not all about technology. It's also about, I guess, a, a psychological frame of mind. I don't know if you want to just maybe um, yeah, embellish a, on that or. I have a, a sort of a vignette for you. Um, in uh, March of 2014, when the Navy went up to the Naval War College to do uh, the LCS war game that was um, directed by the Secretary of Defense when he wanted to, when he first started to truncate the LCS program. Um, they played the game in a manner in which at some point they gave the um, U.S. Navy side a medium-range 130 or so nautical mile surface-to-surface -surface missile and put it on the previously not-so-armed LCSs. Um, and they looked at the, the psychological difference between how the blue commander operated that force and then also how the red commander responded to that force. And what, what, what was interesting uh, about the blue commanders was those ships were, were no more capable of taking a punch than they previously were. They were capable only of delivering a punch more effectively at a longer range. But what that did for the risk calculus in their minds was, to, was for them to say it's harder and he is going to pay a higher cost if he initiates conflict. Therefore, I can take more risk with my force. I think that's important. Mr. Bridenstein, director, and ask for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm a Navy pilot myself. Uh, loved your discussion about the E-2 Hawkeye. I was one of those guys that, uh, that flew off the carrier, and of course we, uh, we did tactics so that they wouldn't know where we were coming from necessarily. Um, and then of course doing the, the MCON recoveries required uh, high intensity operations from the Hawkeye because we would offset pretty a pretty significant dis distance and then, uh, and then control the recovery. Um, I, I would just uh, sh share with you one of the challenges we faced over and over again with network centric warfare as a capability was the interoperations of all the different systems. Uh, we would have, you know, one kind of system for the E-2 Hawkeye, and then the other systems weren't necessarily uh, interoperable with, with what the Hawkeye was using at the time. Um, is there evidence today that all, that there's more interoperability and integration in this network-centric capability that, that we're developing? Uh, sir, I think you and I are probably, I'm probably a little bit older than you are. Not but we probably sort of much. <laughs> probably served as contemporaries, and I, um, I underwent the same nightmare that you did. Um, it's primarily a function of the way we d buy and develop systems and uh, the way we implement standards, technical standards. Uh, this ship, this version of this ship implements the Link 16 standard yep. to this degree. 
the E2C to this degree, the AWACS to this degree, where there are implementation differences, there is mischief. And right. my ship shows the track as a neutral, yours shows it as a unknown to assume friend. Uh, and these are not, these are things that take operator time. We work through that. I think you're seeing more integrated development, more adherence to standards, better what we used to call SIAP, one and only one track per object. Single in integrated air picture. Right, single integrated air picture. Um, that sort of thinking is, uh, is, is much more uh, well established in the fleet and in the joint force. One of the things that really drove that was CEC. Right, which was a Hawkeye initiative. The Hawkeye had a, had a it, what you had were, were a bunch of nodes in the system who, were re, who had the same exact computer algorithms in their combat systems. Right. And they were sharing data so that they all reached the same conclusion. That's not the way it happens in most combat systems um, out there in the fleet and in the joint force. But within CEC, the co cooperative engagement capability, developed in the early 90s and worked out through the, through the 90s and 2000s, that's what we got to use um, in, during that time. So when we network uh, together sufficient um, target information to where we've got actually fire control coordinates that we can launch on from a non-associated platform, uh, obviously that extends the stick out uh, a lot further, which is optimum given the threats that we face. We need to, we need to be able to affect lethality much further away. Um, and the, the challenge uh, that we have in that environment is ID, whether it's uh, maybe emitting something, we can, we can ID it. Uh, non, there are non-cooperative means that we can ID. But as you push you know, the engagement further away, the ID piece gets more and more difficult. Um, how, are there thoughts about how to solve that issue? So I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, one of the chief problems with the Soviet approach, which was to try and build a remote picture um, using electronic uh, signals, uh, direction finding, um, remote radar, they had their radar ocean reconnaissance satellites during the 1970s and 80s, was um, you know, they wanted to be able to build their picture remotely and shoot from a distance, because they knew if they got close, they'd get whacked. Right. But they couldn't do it, because the technology wasn't there, and their command and control architecture wasn't there. And so they had to rely on pathfinders, these suicidal bombers or tattletale service combatants that they pushed in. And really, it would only work in peacetime once, where is marking the carrier, marking whatever uh, important surface uh, force that they, they see important in a given area, and passing the, uh, the coordinates and the uh, contact identification back to a centralized controller, who then uh, uses that to generate the raid targeting. Well, like I said, it only works once. And if you're reliant on long-range uh, exploitation of someone's emissions, maybe they won't oblige you. Right. If you're reliant on a radar picture, well, radars can be deceived. You know, jamming a radar is one option. You can uh, you know, throw out a lot of noise, but there's ways of overcoming that. Deception is a lot harder. Uh, one of the great tricks we used in the Cold War was uh, putting an integrated uh, cover and deception system package on board destroyers. It's called, uh, I believe, the ANSSQ-74. It's not really talked about much, but it existed. And this, uh, this trailer was able to emulate the um, later versions acoustic, but even um, the electronic emissions. Let me, let me uh, I'm out of time, but I wanna get this on the record just so everybody's aware and for the chairman's sake as well. The, the greatest network-centric capability pushing the threat out as far as we can get it, we all, we all love that. At the end of the day, if you have to send a pilot to the merge in order to get a VID, uh, th that's that's not the answer we're looking for. Yeah. So we, we've got to have solutions for that. And with that, I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman for his questions. The gentlelady from Hawaii is recognized, Ms. Cambert, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, gentlemen, for being here. Um, you know, you've, uh, Mr. Salmi, made a lot of references to the Cold War and some of the things that we were able to do then. Um, can you talk about the, the uh, contemporary environment that we're operating in with, uh, both our advanced technology and others, and, and either what, really what the differences are when you're talking about deception uh, between now and, you know, a, a previous generation? Um, well, the physics hasn't changed. You know, we're still dealing with um, electronic emissions exploitation, um, direction finding, perhaps they've become more accurate in their ability to refine areas of uncertainty where a given emitter might be. Um, certainly, 
During the Cold War, the Russians only had a couple satellites up at a time. Now it looks like uh, various uh, competitors might have satellite constellations capable of these types of triangulations up more regularly. Um, we're still looking at space-based radar, the use of synthetic aperture radar to, uh, to build a picture, but it only um, visits a certain area of ocean space for a given period during the day. And so that really hasn't changed. Um, it depends on how many satellites you have up there. Um, the ability to use unmanned vehicles, whether surface, subsurface, aerial, that's kind of different. You know, there might have been a little bit more hesitance, perhaps, to use a manned bomber in that role, though the Soviets didn't seem to have that hesitance. Um, now that you can perhaps use a uh, unmanned system in that role, that's a, that's a major concern. But it also flips it around from our perspective, and getting back to the gentleman's uh, point, you know, if I can't be absolutely sure of what I'm targeting using remote means, using an unmanned system to do a relatively close range, whether visual, infrared, electro-optical, whatever, identification, make sure that I'm, I'm looking at a real contact as opposed to a decoy or someone pretending to be something that they're not. That's a bit of, that's a, bit of a difference. And the technology in that realm is certainly more advanced than it was uh, during the Cold War. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure who's ahead in that regard. I certainly think that's an area of important investment for us. Uh, I don't have a sense of where uh, potential adversaries are on that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McGrath, with the distributed lethality concept, um, what, what are the major points of resistance within the Navy to adopting this? And um, building off the chairman's question, how, how do those changes really come about? You know, I, the more I hear it talked about, the more it seems like the surface guys are pushing on an open door. Um, I think there are some bureaucratic and budgetary rice bowl issues. Um, uh, if we spend X amount of dollars on um, increasing the lethality of the surface force, those dollars have to come from somewhere. Where will they come from? Whose ox gets gored in that process? Um, so I think that would be, but you know, that's the Pentagon. You know, that, that, that's just overhead associated with the way the department is run. So, and that can be, that sort of stuff gets worked through. So I don't see, it's a pretty much an open door. I think the, the Navy Institute has, has a quote saying that there are no leaps of technology required, no massive funding increases necessary. Do you, th do you think that that's accurate? I think it's accurate to a point. I think there are, there are a whole slew of technologies and capabilities that are seven years and in that the surface force could integrate um, that aren't, there's no magic involved. There's no, you know, leap of faith required. There are leaps of faith in the 2030, 2040 force um, that we have to invest in S&T and R&D to get to, but uh, the, a, a good solid uh, instantiation of um, distributed lethality in the 2025 time frame is not a budget breaker. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Mr. Conway is recognized for five minutes. Right, thank you, gentlemen. Um, can you talk to us about where uh, lasers and, and electromagnetic railguns and even in improvements in uh, powdered projectiles fit within these, uh, this innovative time frame? And, and is it, uh, are those something that the Navy's serious about? Or are they just, are they, uh, where, where do they fit? I'll give it a shot. Well, I personally think the Navy is very serious about uh, those technologies. Um, you know, Navy, the Navy leadership is uh, very, very excited from what I've seen in the open press about uh, Railgun in particular. Um, you know, there are plans to uh, demo it on board, I think, uh, the JHSV uh, Millinocket uh, next year. And there's certainly um, you know, people looking at how to get that into the fleet sometime in the late 2020s. Um, I think it's to be determined what type of combatant you put that on, you know, whether you might use a DAG-1000, again, my personal opinion, or whether we look to a new combatant sometime in the late 2020s that uh, if this technology proved out, you, know, you, could, you could put that on. But I, for, for Railgun, I think that, the, I think you were alluding to this, sir, the projectile itself is probably even more important, the ability for the projectile to survive these electromagnetic forces in the barrel and uh, do all kinds of things we want it to do, whether it's uh, land attack or missile defense. Um, that's an open question. As for laser, I think the Navy is also very much in support of that. Um, you, you see the, uh, the talking points on what we've done out in the, in the Persian Gulf on the a, um, AFSB. And I certainly think that the Navy is looking at uh, you know, uh, solid state uh, laser technologies that might be used for point defense, because that's really what it seems like laser would be best capable of doing, especially, in my opinion, for unmanned aerial vehicle defense. Um, you don't want to be burning up hard ordnance, shooting a bunch of UAVs out of the ground or out, out of the sky. 
So I think there's a lot of enthusiasm for that in, uh, in Navy leadership. So where do these, uh, <clears throat> both these technologies fit in the existing structure? I mean, are there, are there you said the DDG-1000 for the rail gun or whatever, is it adaptable to everything that's in the fleet now? Do we have to have a whole new class of ships to make this still work, make those weapons work? I don't think we need a whole new class of ship. We need to bring the integration costs down. The, the railgun is not a cheap capability. It's a wonderful capability, and it's something that um, will and should join the fleet, but it's expensive. And, and when you start to look at uh, the trades and what, what you could get, what other things you could get, those trades uh, sometimes look less attractive. Um, so I think in terms of the weapon itself, but not the but the not the usage. Because the idea with a railgun is that you could shoot a lot of them for and less you, than you 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 wind up you wind up spending less per shot than you would with a missile. That's for sure. Okay. Um, and that that in the long run, it's it's hard to get organizations in the Department of Defense to think life cycle. They like to think acquisition, and they like to think you know the budget that's in front of them like this. But when you start to bring into those bring in those longer range life uh, life cycle things, they make a compelling case for both lasers and the railgun. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Russell is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, you know, I, I had uh, almost identical questions, so uh, along that vein, and then I'll add an extra. And it, it would seem to me in a, a 40 to 50 year overmatch capacity, you know, we're going to continue to have diminishing budgets. Uh, China will continue to have increasing budgets. That will create a delta that will be double uh, between now and 2030, probably of $2 trillion. Um, given that, we, we've got uh, some great potential with the railgun technologies. So when you talk expenses, are, are you saying, is that, is that based upon the power generation uh, piece of this? Is it based upon the ordinance piece of it? What, where would that be? Well, it's, it's, a, it's, just, it's, a consider, it's an expensive piece of gear to buy and integrate. Over the, over the cost of operating it over 20 or 30 years, it's per shot versus a missile system is, is a great savings. And, and we have to think more like that. We have to do, I'm not saying that um, the railgun shouldn't be integrated. I'm saying, trying to give an idea of why it isn't happening faster. But don't you think it would uh, even go beyond that when you look at terms of uh, versatility? You can use it for air defense. You can use it for direct fire. You can use it for long distance. You can use it for land-based um, inter-service use. Uh, it, it would seem that if it had the appropriate level uh, of look, as you say, uh, to look at life cycle, um, that, that there would be great utility, great overmatch, and in the long run, maybe uh, even a cost saving. My personal view is that the railgun's greatest contribution is going to be in missile defense. Yeah, actually, um, which is our number one threat towards our carrier fleet. I, I you know, the, as a direct yeah. fire weapon from the sea, uh, um, even at the, 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 the uh, energy levels that we're talking about in the biggest railgun, we're talking, I think we're talking about something like 200 miles. 200 miles from a uh, land target in some of these fights that we're talking about in the future is pretty close. So I would, I would like that uh, IAMD, the, the missile defense capability, as fast as we can get it. And I'll, I'll waive the uh, UAV laser question because that got answered. Uh, but in terms of uh, capability and capacity, we, we hear in all of these uh, briefings about uh, you know, the 11th carrier and the turnaround. Uh, now we're seeing allies, uh, fortunately, like Great Britain, uh, to launch a couple and uh, France uh, you know, maybe they're going to get a different look at adding carrier number two. We don't know. But regardless, with the amphibious assault ships and the, and, and the last uh, iteration of the WASP class and then you, you, the America class that's rolling out, under, under terms of sea control uh, and forward staging, you know, particularly in the Pacific, there's a lot of versatility there. These are uh, midway size uh, carriers. You know, in appearance, they certainly provide a, an awful lot of capacity. What thinking is the Navy doing with regard to that? If we have forward stage based stuff, and now we can have sea control uh, with the uh, amphibious assault ships, is that even part of the equation when looking at carrier structure and presence? Let me, let me answer that. Um, 
the amphibious assault ships with the F-35B embarked are going to be incredible uh, assets in the, in, in the Navy and Marine Corps for the maritime fight. That plane is a fantastic uh, combat vehicle for doing a whole lot of things. It's not just air to mud. The stuff that it can do uh, in terms of this anti-surface integrated air and missile defense, there are all sorts of uh, things that the Navy and the Marine Corps need to cooperate much more closely in order to get the benefits out of that to the war fight. They are th thinking and working in that regard. I think, and, I, and I've written pretty wildly, wi widely about this, it's, it is not correct to think of the America class with F-35Bs as a substitute, and I'm not saying you said this, no, but a just substitute. No, versatility. An it option. is a, it is a, a gap it's, filler, it's which we hear it's all extender, the time we need. It's a gap filler. It is a, uh, it's a capability that we're going to get a whole lot more out of than we can get currently out of the 88Bs in the. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. McGrath, Ms. Sean, thank you so much for your testimony. Um, Ms. Graham has waived uh, any questions she might have for you, and you heard the bells they told for us, but we want to make sure that we've given you a last couple of minutes for any wrap-up that either of you might have before we adjourn. Mr. McGrath? I'd like to thank Mr. Courtney in his absence for using the phrase hardening. Um, the, the Air Force, when we talk about air bases, we talk about hardening, hardening air bases, air bases that aren't going anywhere. I mean, they're, they're just going to stay there. Um, we talk about survivability with respect to ships, and it, I think it levies a rhetorical uh, weight upon the Navy that I'm personally trying to change by using the word hardening. We want to harden the surface force, um, make, it, make it fight through damage and deliver more damage to the other guy, and I thank Mr. Courtney for using that word. Okay, Mr. Sullivan? Um, I think that uh, it's important to view disparate lethality as a set of options. It's not purely offensive, or at least it shouldn't be. And I don't believe, as Mr. McGrath said earlier, that it's going to be subtracting from defensive unless we you know, make a mistake in how we define the concept. I see disparate lethality as a tool for our force commanders, for our, for our theory commanders, to give them more options at every stage of the conflict uh, spectrum. And to the extent that electronic warfare supports that, you know, there's certainly less things you can do during phase zero, phase one, the, the shaping, the turns than you can do when you're actually in combat. But there are things you can do there. I think there's a lot of histor rich historical uh, examples um, of how we did psychological shaping of the Soviets um, during the late Cold War to help deter them from any belief that they would be successful in a first salvo. I think that is pretty crucial. And so the extent that uh, the Navy can look at that rich history, which is still largely classified, and uh, derive new ideas for how we might condition some of our great uh, power adversaries or potential adversaries, um, that today is not the day using tools like these. I think that's very important to think about. Okay. Well, thank you both for um, being here today and for the contributions you make to the national defense of our country. And with that, we're adjourned. <laughs>